Hey. Hi, Anthony. Hey, Jonathan. <clears throat> Where are you located at the moment? I'm in Sydney, Clarence Street. What about what about yourself? Singapore, Amoy Street. Okay. <laughs> I thought you might be in Melbourne. <laughs> then I would no, see, no, then no. I would see the interior of your house. <laughs> no, no, this is our, we're back in the office, so uh, yeah. I'm in the office. Great. That's Jane. Okay. And I think you said you were oh, at a WeWork office, right? Uh, um, so, sorry, myself. I'm, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in a place called Found 8. So it's kind okay. of like a, a WeWork. Um, yeah. Hi, Jane. And hi, Danny. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. Let me queue up my slides here so I'm ready to go. Yeah, we, we can test it if you want. Uh, I, I tested it before just to make sure that it worked in another room, so I assume it's going to work here. Just okay. Fine. All right. Yeah, well, I guess while we've got no one else here, I may as well test it. Well, I think we have seven, seven people here. Let's see who's here. Hello to everybody here. Aaron Lee, is it? Aaron? Alex? Anyway, a few people. So time will go very quickly. This is, and a lot to cover, I think. Let's see how it goes. So uh, yeah, so feel free to just sort of uh, put anything on the chat. It's all quite informal. So anyone has got any questions along the way, just just put them down there, and we we can even even deal with them afterwards if they if they, if they come later. <laughs> So Danny, I see. What what time is it where you are? Are you in? Uh, let me see. Tokyo. So the same time as Singapore. Uh, one hour ahead. I'm one halfway hour. between you and Singapore. And are you are you in a lockdown situation or what's it like there in Tokyo? Uh, well, some people are going on about it. So okay, okay, cool. All right. Good. Let's see the time. Okay, we'll just give it a little bit more time. So this should be this should be very interesting, right? I think a lot of myths will be busted here. <laughs> In terms of what, yeah, what modern uh, modern uh, infrastructure and apps look like, so we we'll we'll come to that. Okay, why don't why not get started? A few people are here already, and uh, this is in the format of a roundtable, so pretty conversational. I think we're going to be having uh, some introductory uh, slides, but before that, I'd like to just set the context uh, for this session, which is the topic of modern software factory. To go fast forever, right? So we we'll find out what that that means. Um, this is positioned as VMware. Of course, VMware Pivotal Labs are now one. So the focus is on accelerating innovation, not so much just through modernizing infrastructure, but modernizing um, existing apps and creating new apps. So 
the idea here is what does a modern software organization look like? We'll be looking at the important things to measure and why does that matter and how to transform processes as well as, of course, the technology, the tools. And increasingly, we're seeing the people in the organization uh, to be led by the business. So these are things that have come up across all the round tables. Now, for introductions, uh, I'll first go with Anthony because he's he's the local rep for the uh, say regional director for the application business unit in ANZ, um, with a very strong software background from Pivotal Labs before the acquisition. Uh, CA, if everyone remembers that, Dynatrace Hitachi Data Sun. If people remember Sun, right? I think it ages us. Um, so. Following from that, we have Danny Burks, who's Senior Director of Application Services. And I was just reading the background, a very interesting background for me, because uh, Danny founded the uh, VMware Pivotal Labs in San Francisco, right? And then brought it to um, Tokyo, where you're located right, right now. Right? So, That's right. You know, how, how things are different there and what you can apply. So you're part of VMware Application Services, and your remit is Asia Pacific and Japan. Yeah. Good. Um, so we're also not forgetting Jane sitting there. So Jane is uh, Business Development Director AMZ for P uh, VMware Pivotal Labs, to give it correct name. So, so we have plenty of expertise here. Um, let's look at the time. So a brief intro. Um, I'll let Danny. Uh, further introduce the, 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 the context of what does software actually mean and what does go faster forever mean? And then we can take some questions and have a conversation, I hope. Okay, so, great. Thank you. You'll, you'll be sharing your screen. So yes, I will. Right. So, uh, you know, the, this, this will be build this mythical organization that can go fast forever and innovate at very high speed. So obviously there's going to be a lot of opinions in here. Right. I mean, we, we're bringing a lot of opinions based on the success that we've seen over the years and the hundreds of customers that we work with. So what I wanted to do first is just present a, a very short, like three slide presentation, just to state explicitly what we believe works uh, and what we believe good looks like. And then we can run some of the questions off of that. And uh, all of you can challenge those uh, notions if you want. And I'm, I'm happy to spend as much time as you want talking about what we believe. Um, so let me share my screen here. Um, have you got that? So we can see yeah. it. For, for, for people to view it, you can double click on it and you can also pinch it to zoom in on the details in case there's some nice diagrams in there you need to see. Okay. Uh, well, I need to go into pre present mode. So there we go. Can you see that? Yep. Like I said, it's just a statement of what we're product organizations. A few things. First, uh, the way you differentiate yourself from your competitors these days is your rate of change over time. That is to say, how fast can you iterate on your software? Not how fast can you deliver it initially or, or how many features it has when you initially deliver it, but how quickly you can change over time. And in fact, we think that go so far as to say your only lasting advantage over your competition is your ability to iterate faster. Uh, and another way to say that is your only lasting advantage is if you can learn faster than your competitors. Um, we believe that there are four metrics that matter most as you measure yourself to see uh, how well you're doing now and as you measure yourself over time to ensure that you're improving. Uh, there are four metrics that we think matter. Those are Deployment frequency, that is how, how quickly, how often can you deploy software to production? Lead time for changes, that is once you decide to, to develop a new feature or a new application, how long does it take you to get that application into the hands of your customers? Change failure rate, that is as you iterate on software and deliver continuously day by day, uh, there are going to be failures. There will be times when you deploy and things break. How quickly can you back out of that back to a known good state uh, and minimize the disruption to your customers? Uh, and the last thing is time to recover. So again, related to change failure rate, when things uh, 
fail in production, which is sometimes not a function of deploying, but maybe you just have problems with the stability of your infrastructure or your services. How long does it take you to recover from that? So those are the four metrics that we think matter most. The two at the top, deployment frequency and lead time to changes, that's really just about throughput. How quickly can you run this machine to get new value to your users? And then the things on the bottom are about stability. As you're moving that fast, how stable can you keep the system? So those are the four, four metrics that we think matter most. And finally, uh, we believe that there, there are five factors correlated with high, high performance, and you should assess yourself along these five factors. The first is uh, effective cloud usage. That how effectively are you leveraging cloud? Uh, and when we say cloud, I want you to think about how you're writing software, not just where you're deploying that software. Uh, the second uh, factor is how effectively you're using structured platforms. That is, you should not be spending your time building platforms and scripts to tie AWS services together. You should be spending your time and money investing in building things that bring value to your customers. If you're a bank, if you're an insurance company, if you're in retail, your customers aren't paying you because of your expertise at spinning up uh, um, AWS servers, right? They're paying you for your expertise at bringing them awesome experiences without buying, buying your product. The third factor, infrastructure is code. That is just really about automate as much as you can, right? Everything that happens to get your code from uh, development to production, uh, as much of that should be automated as possible. Uh, the fourth thing is about empowered cross-functional teams. So uh, that is to say your team should be composed in a way such that they can make decisions independently and move forward in, in new product directions uh, as, as quickly and as independently as possible. So that's about avoiding uh, or, or minimizing the, the amount of number of approvals and change boards and ways that procedures that you have to go through to respond to changes that you see in the market and in your company. And the last thing is a high maturity and continuous delivery disciplines. And that is to say that your team should be practicing modern methods like TDD, test-driven development, pairing, CI-CD, domain-driven design. Uh, so, I, and I think it's significant that things like the methodology that you're that your teams are, are practicing are, are only one of these five factors, right? So it's a lot about culture and a little bit about technology is really the way that I look at that. Um, and then finally, you know, we, we have some very opinionated ways of engaging. Uh, we do have ways to engage with you through these things called office hours, which is where we will offer you free consulting on a product problem that you have. And that may be a technical problem or a product market fit problem or a design problem. But if you visit this URL, you can sign up for some free consulting for, from us where you'll get uh, more of these opinions and more of the lessons learned. So that, that's all that I have to say right now. So we'd like to get right to the questions. Hey, right. So thanks, Danny. It's a very comprehensive uh, framework for KPIs and the five factors. Hey, I apologize. There's a bit of background noise. So I hope we don't get too distracted here. And in fact, that's one of the questions, right? <laughs> Maybe I'll kick off with that question. Is, um, you know, how do you think this, uh, this situation we're in uh, around COVID would, 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 would change things and bring in all these, these changes around how customers choose what they need, how businesses prioritize, and how things are actually executed, right? So I, I'll, put, I'll put, put the elephant in the room, right? <laughs> the situation that we're actually in today how has that brought on really this need to um, to go fast, to um, produce the right kind of products for the right kind of problems, and leverage the investments that are already there? You know the kind of tensions that might exist in companies, the before, the as is, and the future situation. A big question. Well, I, think, yeah, I, I think we've seen over the past five years or more. Uh, a, a not so gradual uh, transition to uh, the primary way that most businesses engage with their customers is through software. So we've seen a transition away from phys physical engagement and more towards software engagement. Um, I think the current situation has accelerated that tremendously uh, because it's not just a matter of convenience for customers and for, for, 
clients anymore. It's a matter of safety, right? So I think customers are demanding more software-based engagement with the brands that they know and trust. Uh, and so to the extent that many enterprises already had innovation programs that they were planning to execute over the next three years, five years, 10 years, uh, all that stuff's being pulled in now. Uh, so I, I believe companies have to go faster now because, uh, you know, the march towards innovation is driven by changes in the market, and we've seen more changes in the market in the last six months than we've seen in many years prior. Right? So I think it's only accelerated. Mm. Mm. Does anyone else want to comment from from your own personal experiences? Maybe maybe an ANZ. I mean, there's there's a lot happening there, right, <laughs> around this COVID. I, I think um, just. Prioritization, um, Jonathan, and you know, working out what's the most meaningful thing to focus on, you know, to to um, increase the engagement with with customers the way that they want to be engaged with. So um, there's a big issue around, you know, the remote engagement with customers that um, has driven has driven organisations to think differently, um, and maybe those platforms or um, platforms for engagement don't exist. So how would we go about building something in a meaningful way quickly um, has been a big focus of how do we get started with something? So um, seen a lot, a, lot of, a, a lot of that in the NZ market. Yeah, how do we get started has been a very common question in the list of questions. So the, 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 right. you know, um, we've got a question from Alex, but maybe we come to that later. Because tying into this, recognizing there is a change in the market and the customers and a, a demand, from an internal point of view, how how's it working out with the mindset, maybe within Pivotal, maybe within your clients, of the business, of the product managers, um, so that they can adapt and ensure that they're building something that, that is relevant for, for the users. Um, and they're doing it in a way that is at, at the pace which is needed. Yeah, well, I'd say if you look at the, uh, the methodology that we find successful and compare it with the way that a lot of software teams are run today, uh, specifically with regard to product management and design, uh, I think the most important mind shifts to make are that um, design is not an upfront thing. Uh, design needs to be done in, in an agile, uh, continuous way, just as we believe development needs to, to to uh, change to be continuous and incremental and design needs to do the same thing. From a product management standpoint, I'd say uh, some of the most important mind shifts are to be comfortable with shipping less, uh, to be uh, comfortable with shipping software to production and getting it in the hands of your users before you think it's finished, uh, and which is really a, a acknowledgement of the fact that you're more many research. So get users using software in their hands, uh, gather their feedback, and change direction based on this. Uh, that that is a a very that can be a very difficult cultural shift for product managers to make when they come from backgrounds where they're asked to specify everything up front and then go build the software as a separate step. Yeah, the so-called waterfall method. Yeah. In fact, I'm not sure if you've heard this saying, if I get it right, start finishing, stop starting. Start finishing, get the product release out and stop starting. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think what we believe is there, there's, there's not really a finish, right? Um, software's never done. Your job is to get it as soon as possible. The regime can User feedback is the most valuable thing that you can have as a software team. So you need to optimize to getting it as soon as possible and getting it as often as possible. So that's a continuous feedback uh, situation also. It's not like user research at the beginning of a project and now that we know, we understand the problem, now we'll go build a solution. That just, in our experience, that doesn't work. Yes, the, so the, the iterative approach. Uh, from the developer's perspective, being part of the team, um, are there any sort of pitfalls? Is there something that they need to keep in mind? Do you have any tips? Well, I mean, there's a lot of cultural change on the part of the developers also, um, which is to say that uh, 
you know, traditionally teams have been built in ways such that uh, developers have specialized in areas of the code. Ship over certain areas of the code, and if you need to know how this part of the code works, you go talk to this person. And if you need to know how this other part, you go talk to this other person. But we believe very strongly in collective code ownership for many, many reasons, which I could talk about and take more time than we have to. But we really need to have this notion of the code base is owned by the entire team. Uh, and we have some particular methods like pairing and rotating pairs that we practice to kind of ensure that that knowledge gets spread across the team. Um, but that's one of the, the, the hardest cultural shifts for developers is to get away from this notion of personal ownership of certain parts of the code and more to the, to the uh, viewpoint that, that the entire team owns this product and everybody has shares ownership. Yep. So uh, what, what, what's happening in Australia? Are, are you seeing, um, I'll put this to, uh, to Anthony. Uh, are, are you seeing there's a level of maturity in Australia? People are running agile, for want of a better word. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, desire. I think there are pockets of extreme, um, uh, of you know, it's extreme. The bell curve exists, right? You know, and I think there is a lot of um, really good examples of it happening. Um, uh, but I still think that there's plenty of opportunity um, to uh, to accelerate some of it. So um, there's a lot of waterfall happening in, in a lot of organizations. And I think um, that's no different to many other mature markets in the world. I think we're, we're no different. Um, and But there are some real pockets of some great examples of organizations that have adopted this and some of this methodology. And um, uh, yeah, so it's it's quite diverse. And I think some, some of the best examples will come from the most unexpected places. Uh, whereas you, right. you might expect this, this approach to be uh, more palatable to startups and companies without a lot of uh, baggage over time built up in terms of old ways of developing software. But some of the, by far, the, the most return on investment that we've seen with clients have been with uh, some of the oldest enterprises in Australia and even in government. Uh, we've had true yep. success in government, which is not somewhere where you really think of when you think of innovation, but we've been tremendously innovative using our methods. Yes. And, and, and without it sounding like a commercial, I mean, you know, the experience of uh, Pivotal Labs goes back 30 years from starting up in Silicon Valley, um, where the expertise and the knowledge of how to build, you know, and, and software this, this way, um, and then pivoted to the enterprise. So there's a lot of experience that that's part of, you know, the engagement we bring to organizations is understanding how to think like startups, but operate in, you know, in many cases, the enterprise, the complexities of the enterprise worlds they um, they exist in or they're working in today with, with the, you know, the, the environments that they have to operate within. Yeah, I mean, leg legacy is a real thing. <laughs> especially in some yes. of the mature and it's quite possible to have an overlay in organizations both people operating systems and of course the technology for coexisting comes to another question here where do you start in the organization is it all about the top level the c level uh, you know one imagines they may want to play safe different types of organization and uh, are short-sighted right We've got a current emergency now. Just bring me the revenue, bring me the sales, or cut costs. Um, so, um, how, how, do, how, how do you see your customers um, cut, uh, manage that balance of driving the, the need to be agile and re react responsive? I would say, at the same time, manage costs, and at the same time, uh, keep people safe from working at home and so forth. How, how, how do you see that decision happening? Is it is it happening within the IT department? Is it happening at the top level? Or where does it need to happen? Well, I'd say that when we show up at a new client and are, are advocating for these fairly radical ways of working versus what they're doing now, we, we have a huge credibility problem, right? I mean, they, they have a successful business already, and we're telling them that they're doing things wrong, basically. So the way we try to address that is we try to start very small companies. So rather than try to take on a huge program and transform their hundreds or thousands of developers, 
We'll look for a project that's already on their roadmap, something that's already high priority for them, uh, and where we think we can uh, be uh, additive in terms of helping them get that done faster, cheaper, get it, really get it to market faster, even if it's a lesser thing than they had originally planned to do. Right. So uh, the way we start with new clients is by starting on a single project, which typically lasts anywhere from what will spec out anywhere from say three to five months is kind of an initial engagement. Uh, and if we haven't shown value by the end of that time, if, if they're not completely convinced that the way we do things is going to produce an order of magnitude uh, more value creation than the way they're doing it now, then I'd say we fail. And we don't fail very often. So it, starting that way has been very uh, productive for us because we are able to show value very quickly. Uh, to your point, risk aversion is, is a problem, right? So if, if our argument was, hey, you need to choose us to help you transform your entire lot of developers, uh, that's asking them to take on a lot more risk than to say, we'd like to come work with this one team of yours or this fixed uh, contained um, period of time, a short period of time, and we'd like to prove to you that we can help you. So that, that's how we get over that. But I would like to speak to your uh, what you said about uh, there being risk aversion at the top. We actually find that it's often just the opposite of that, right? So the, the, at the sea level, there's there's very often a acknowledgement that it's necessary to innovate and they want their teams and their company to deliver software in a different way. Uh, and uh, we very often have support at the sea level. Uh, where it gets hard is kind of in the middle levels. That's where you should really find a lot of the risk aversion. Because at the very bottom where the developer, I don't want to say that way, but where the developers and the product managers, the people that are actually building the products, oftentimes they'll be very excited about engaging in a new way also. So that the, 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 uh, the challenge is sometimes in the middle of it. <laughs> I just I just add to that that I think um, and the the engagement that we feel is very different is that it's it, it's about bringing the whole team together from the top to the bottom so that everybody's included in this um, so everybody feels a part of it it's like there's a safety net um, associated with this is part of the cultural um, change and thinking that that comes through an engagement um, with you know, with the pivotal labs business so we help. Uh, we help facilitate that and introduce new ways of thinking and new ways with dealing with things, which you know, which facilitates that. Yeah, and I can imagine simply from this brief conversation how you've already framed it around the KPIs and the five factors, right? That that is already a very simple way to get people aligned. And and, and Danny, when you say we don't fail, I'm starting to see how that might be possible because every failure is fed back into the system. In fact, you try, it seems that you try and break things, but then improve on it, not break it in a, in a, in a I'm not want to beat up on the waterfall method, but not find out nine months later that the project's a failure, right? You're gonna find out soon enough. So, uh, that's how I understand what you mean by failure. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, any experienced technologist will tell you that, um, Failure is inevitable, right? I mean, every project has its failures, though. You, you need a process that optimizes for learning, not for shipping software, because shipping is not success. Right? Yeah, we've got a bit cut off there. So I'm looking at time. We've, we've still got about five minutes. I, I'm wondering here. I know we've been talking quite high level about the mindset, about what you've seen happen. Are there any examples? I would say by industry, because you said earlier that like this innovation happens in places you don't expect it, maybe public sector, uh, certainly healthcare in public sector. Um, there's there's so many industries. So perhaps you could share something in the ANZ perspective on, on where you're seeing these pockets in, of innovation and, and adoption of this methodology. Yeah, I, I, I turn that to Anthony uh, to talk about things in this specific, in the ANZ market. Yeah, I, and I don't think it's well, absolutely. And I don't think it's any different to to any um, any particular industry anywhere that's trying to engage with citizens um, or with with you or I as individuals is looking to transform the way 
and deliver services differently than the physical way they perhaps many places used to, you know, whether it's banks, you know, whether it's insurance wanting to put the capability of, you know, of users um, to claims processing or, you know, paying fines or whatever, any, any of those and all of those are all things that um, organizations are grappling with, which is, you know, um, thinking of, a, of having to do it a different way and engaging through a different platform. So it's not anything that um, is, in fact, you know, not wanting to use the word, um, you know, the, the, dig, the overused digital transformation. It's accelerated some of the things organizations have wanted to do, which is to enable more self-serve um, and, you know, get, get more in the hands of, um, of you, you and I, the individuals, um, than having to rely on traditional methods. So there's no particular industry or sector. I think everybody that's engaging with us as individuals is, is impacted or, or we have opportunity with. All right. So I think we've got to digest this, right? Because it, it, it sounds like generic message, but it's actually the real life situations that you're seeing. Yeah. Innovation can happen anywhere, anytime. It's for people to take the leadership and be transparent and work together. Look, I have to put on my technical hat. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll give you a curveball in questions. Uh, we're going to have technical people here. Uh, and I, I, look, I, I know, I know people have got some, some, some great tech through, through uh, building it and through acquisitions. So, so if I'm a manager and I say, you know, the solution to this, I might be an IT manager, is microservices. We, we definitely need to, uh, we definitely need to have um, microservices, K8, whatever it is, Kubernetes, um, or, you know, what should we do, all right? Should we just take our system and decompose it? Um, you know, what would you say to that in terms of how much is hype, how people can put that in the context of what we've been discussing around a software factory and going faster? Well, I would say that those technologies that you mentioned and, and all technologies are enablers, right? They, they are not solutions. So the, the solution is how you build your, how you construct your teams and how your teams operate and how those pieces of technology enable your team. So the, the, uh, the measure of success is how fast can you get value in the hands of your users, your customers, right? Uh, we sell a lot of products that can help accelerate that, but none of those products know what's valuable to your customers. Right? So you, you have to bring your teams in to learn how to work together uh, in a way that enables this type of continuous delivery of value, and they have to know how to operate these products that enable them to do that. So I, I just state very clearly that technology is not a solution, it's an enabler. Okay, and I'm sure you have to remind people of that many times. <laughs> right? Yeah. Jane, sorry, I'm, so, yeah. I, I've not brought you in here, but you're not, you're not ignored. Uh, I'm just wondering. Um, That's completely fine, Jonathan. <laughs> we have got one question here from, from Alex. Uh, can you see it on your chat? Yes. Yep. So rather than read it out, there's a few points in here. What I would really ask you to do is, is to read it yourself and see which elements you would like to pull out and relate to the, the topic of this, of this round table. I think it's speaking to what we've just been talking about to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would yeah, say that Alex is absolutely right. The yeah. way we address that, by having our teams work directly with the customer teams and help them establish a culture that produces the results that we're talking about and, and that involves using certain technology. But we don't believe you can really get trained on a culture. What you have to do is learn it by doing it, and that's what we do. We, we literally pair with the customer for three to five months so that they can learn how to do it from our teams who have been doing it successfully yes, for quite a definitely. long time. Well, thanks for that. How can people contact you? Um, I think what we have to do is we have to finish this round table now. So much thanks to, to everybody here and the, the participants. Um, what would you encourage people to do as a, as a next step in terms of places they could visit or maybe even reaching out to you individually? Yeah. 
Yeah, just yeah, Danny, we put a um, Danny put a, 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 a URL to reach out to us. Um, you know, we we I'm sure there'll be our details will be shared as part of the um, uh, as part of the wrap up here. I mean, we can put some contact details in the chat if anybody yeah, wants to reach out to us. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. If, um, look, if anyone's interested in the initial um, chat, um, then yeah, by all means, uh, send, send us an email. My email is njane at vmware.com um, or uh, either Danny or, or Anthony Clark would be very happy for you to, to reach out to them as well. Um, as uh, Danny mentioned, we do have uh, an offering called Office Hours where we walk through a, a problem or an opportunity with you. And I, I suppose it's it's free consulting where we, where we show, show you how that we can how we can help. So we'd be very happy to, to talk to you about, about that offering as well. And I've pasted that URL. Thanks, Danny. Thanks very much. Um, if, if I just if I, if just say the chat will be open. So what I've seen after these roundtables are uh, people start thinking a little bit, and then it pops up in the chat for the next ten minutes. I won't ask no any uh, gentleman or lady to to remain for the next ten minutes, but you certainly got access to the chat. So with that, I will close this roundtable with thanks to all the speakers and the participants who who are welcome to share any burning questions that come to mind afterwards. So thanks very much. Have a great thanks. day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.